Okay. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Kid Scoot Media Online. Uh, today we have three awesome scoopers. We have Sarah, Ryan, and Lilibet, and our guest is Kelly, Dr. Kelly Kent from the Culver City School Board. All right, you guys. So Lilibet, do you want to ask the first question? Okay. So, um, Dr. Kent, I was wondering, so like, thanks for supporting all the un underserved citizens of Culver City and feeding them and supporting them. I was just wondering, like, can kids get involved in it? And also, like, I was wondering if you could elaborate more on that idea. I would love to talk about that. It's one of the main things I'm doing right now in this new chapter of life. Um, I will just answer the first question about students volunteering or, or minors volunteering to say that, you know, of course they would need permission from guardians. My daughter's been doing it. She's 12, she's in seventh grade. And we're just following, you know, the gloves and the mask guidelines. I think now it, it may be advised that people start wearing goggles. I wear my glasses every time. Um, I'm not sure how we're gonna handle that with my daughter. I don't think she's gonna wanna wear swim goggles. <laughs> But we've also just made sure that her volunteering happens inside of the building. And so she actually isn't interacting with the folks that are waiting to receive the groceries. And so that may uh, keep the volunteers safer, especially for the minors. So I would encourage folks to talk to their parents and guardians and make sure it's okay. And then they can definitely reach out to me or Lisa at the Peace Project directly and we can facilitate it. It's actually a, a great experience. It's fun to work with everybody in that food bank setting. And then I can describe it a little bit, which is that we've done three weeks so far. The first two weeks were just like a rapid response effort to fill in the gap of spring break because CCUSD typically does not feed students over spring break. And under normal circumstances, that seems to be okay. Clearly, these are not normal circumstances. People's incomes have plummeted. And so there, there, it was very likely we could, thought that people would not have a way to feed their families. Mm -hmm. And actually it was Lisa Schultz who called me. She, she runs the whole nine gallery on Main Street in Culver City and, and she, it's a way of supporting this peace project work that she does. And she called and said, do you think the school district needs help feeding families over the break? And when I called the superintendent, Leslie Lockhart, and then I called our school and family support services director, Veronica Montez, and they both affirmed right away, yes, we have that need because we aren't doing the grab and go lunches. Mm -hmm. And then also backpacks for, for kids, which you may be familiar with is a program that gives backpacks for the weekends for folks who might need help with food on the weekends. And uh, it was also not running on, on the break. And so Lisa uh, made arrangements with um, community members and restaurant members. So, you know, lots of supporters like Sorrento's Italian Market and Old Fella and Larder's Bakery and um, um, Copenhagen, uh, supported by donating, but also uh, helping Lisa have direct connections with the purveyors that would typically only sell to restaurants. And so in that way, she was able to call directly and buy bulk things, which that can be really, that can be a real barrier. And so she was able to buy like bulk cheese and bulk broccoli and romaine. And so we ended up making these beautiful grocery bags that had cereal, rice, pasta, um, stewed tomatoes with some recipes about how to make really good yummy sauce. And then cheese, butter, olive oil, like these perishables that can be harder to find in a, in a, um, in a food bank scenario. So it's been really wonderful. We have at least 20 volunteers every Tuesday and Wednesday that come and help us pack the bags and then we hand them all out to, it's been ranging from 140 to 180 families every week. Uh, the first two weeks of spring break really supported our CCUSD families. And it seems like now we're seeing actually that some, um, some staff members are taking advantage of the groceries, which speaks to the uh, the real hard times that folks are experiencing because there's underemployment. What, what is the location that? Yeah, so it's, it's on Main Street in Culver City and it's 3830 Main Street at the Whole Nine Gallery on Wednesdays at 11 a.m. 
for two hours. Have you been able to um, adequately serve the people who are coming to your food bank or have you been facing shortages? So the first week we felt like we had about 150 and we felt like we were short. Mm -hmm. uh, we were able to extend what we had, like make some bags smaller to mm -hmm. provide for that shortage. And so we didn't turn anyone away, but it didn't feel good to have to scrap like that. Um, mm -hmm. So the second week we ordered more, that was when we went through 180 and that um, was about right. The order matched the need. Mm -hmm. um, and then this third week we, had a few extra, maybe like to eight grocery bags, but it's a lot of food because it's two bags per family. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's because we're still trying to find the sweet spot between how to serve the community, but also make sure that if CCUSD in particular needs access, that we're providing that access. So the first two weeks of spring break, we did a robocall and an email to let all the families know, all 7,000 families know. We didn't do that this past week because we had the grab and go lunches were back up and running and they were doing breakfast and lunch at two sites at La Bayona and at the high school. And then also Backpacks was up and running and they do that food for Thursday through Sunday. And they were expanding actually. They were putting more food in and expanding their list. So it just wasn't clear what the need would be. And so um, we didn't send out a big email or a robocall, but we did have this shift where there were still some families who were students, but also the staff phenomenon. So we had a little bit extra, but I have a feeling going into this next week that we're gonna um, have a much better system and the district is going to send out notifications to all families and staff that we are on the list of resources available locally. So you may have seen something like that in the past, but it will be up on a website and it will be sent out to all families that these groceries will continue to be available on Wednesdays for I would say like at least six weeks. Great. Uh, Ryan, you have a question? Um, I just wanted to know about like kids who need like psychological services, is there anything running for those kids who need that help, like who need someone to talk to? Or like, should they like, well, first they should talk to their parents, but like, is there anyone else like besides their parents that there's someone they could talk to, like a school counselor or anything other than that? Yeah, so it's a really great, great question. And I don't know that, especially in secondary, that it you necessarily need to go to your parents first because there may be some things that oh, okay. it's more comfortable to talk with a different adult about. But so um, the counseling, so this is also through our school and family services department, um, which is not something that I think most students are familiar with, but that's where counseling lives. And they do have, so all the sites have counseling websites and then the district has a main counseling website and the counselors are super available right now. So they are definitely making Zoom appointments with students. They're totally ready, willing and able. And so um, I would encourage, and I know counselors are reaching out to individual families, um, but I would definitely encourage students to feel like they can reach out to counselors. And then regarding the counselors that were at the Sandy Siegel Youth Health Center, I actually don't have that answer. And I can find out and ask that answer, but I would start with going through the counseling resources that are already online and reaching out there, and then they can connect you to Sandy Siegel Youth Health Center therapists. And I'll, and I'll get back to you on the answer with respect to that. I know Venice Family Clinic is running virtually and they said that they would be available to any and all of our students. So it might be that Sandy Siegel Youth Health Center is offline right now, but that Venice Family Clinic is taking our students virtually. Okay. Does that Thank answer you. your question? Yeah. Sarah? Um, so my question has to do more so with um, just finances and things going in the future because I'm sure that in the next year or so probably um, the school board is going to be facing budgetary shortage or cuts or um, just less revenue than they were hoping for. And I was wondering if the school board has a plan thus far as to how to deal with that, what kinds of programs are considering cutting down on or um, the different what they're considering doing to um, uh, overcome this obstacle. Yeah, so I'm excited to answer this question because I've been thinking about it a lot in the past 48 hours. Um, 
And I'm gonna, I'm gonna not say so much about what CCUSD plans because on the one hand, I don't know that we really know yet. On the other hand, the board has not met to discuss this particular item. And then thirdly, um, I just don't know how much um, would be appropriate to share publicly in terms of internal conversations about what that fiscal crisis could look like at this point, but we definitely will be talking about it publicly soon. Um, but what I do want to share is that it's for sure a national and a statewide issue. And what I learned, I think would be really interesting to you guys. So if you'll, if you'll allow me to look at notes while I talk to you, um, basically the, 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 the comparisons are being made over and over and over again to the 2008 recession, right? And what we know is that we're really going to experience a huge budget impact in the fall of 2020, okay? So there's a big de decline predicted. And as you said, Sarah, you said that, but that those austerity budgets will come. We'll get the governor's revised budget in September, and that will reflect personal income as way down, sales tax, personal income tax is way down, sales tax is way down, property values way down, and capital gains loss from the stock market, which will affect our pensions and so forth, right? And so it's basically predicted that the, um, both with the downturn as well as with the increased cost per student, so we are gonna have increased costs for summer school to help folks catch up, as well as for increased meal expenses because these um, personal income impacts are going to be so long standing that it's estimated that it's going to cost about another five or six hundred dollars per student to educate them annually. I'm on a video. I'm going to um, tell Bruce to give me one moment. I'm so sorry. I know okay, we're recording. Okay. No, it's okay. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm back. So th these are the perils of, you know, working from home. Right. And homeschooling and all of that. We're all familiar with it. Okay. So it, that it would cost five to $600 extra per student annually. Right. And so all of that is to be context because if you compare it to the 2008-9 crisis, the cuts at that time ended up being about 20%. Okay. So we can anticipate at least that, if not more, because you could argue that this is a much more profound crisis, fiscally speaking, as well as otherwise. Eventually in 2008, you know, after the fact in, in the stimulus packages, we got education nationally, got a hundred billion dollars, okay? But the total stimulus package was 800 billion. So compare it to the current package that just passed, which was a $2.2 .2 trillion package. That's a three times the size package, but schools, education nationally got one third of the level as part of the package, okay? So com comparing it to 2008, I hope that makes sense. So basically the ask from national advocates, so I've been on these calls with groups who are statewide school board members, but also nationally, and we're basically making these calls along with superintendents associations, national school boards associations, unions, um, national PTA associations to basically say that it's not nearly enough and we really need to demand hundreds of billions as specifically toward education in this next stimulus package which the house is going to be considering. So that's what we're working on right now. So um, that's the thing that I've been thinking about and writing letters and I was on the phone with Jacqueline Hamilton who is the field rep for Karen Bass, who some of you know, and we talked for a long time yesterday and she was really grateful to hear from me because this was not on our Congress members um, radar. And so it's really important. I also had, and as well, uh, school board president Summer McBride and I both spoke with Senator Holly Mitchell the previous week in response to the, you may have heard that we had sent out layoff notices to our Office of Child Development staff. And so we are definitely talking to our state and national representatives all the time. And I've been thinking about this budget crisis a lot. And uh, you know, I'll have more to say about the specifics for Culver City probably in the next couple of weeks. Right. Lily Bet, what, would you, what do you have next? I was wondering like what the schools are gonna do to like try and grade all the students fairly. Like even though the quick transition like caught us all by surprise. Yeah, it's a good question. So I, again, here's where I'm going to tell you that the specifics for CCUSD are not ironed out. 
Um, we have a board meeting on the 14th on Tuesday, so I expect to learn more at that time. Um, I do know that um, there are are models being set in other districts that I expect us to be looking to. So again, forgive me for not having detail about Culver City, but that I know that the machinations are happening now and they are working out the details um, with internally as well as with the teachers and the unions. Um, but I can tell you that one example of a district that is doing something that I am interested in is that the MA, MOU, the um, memorandum of understanding with their unions was that um, grades can improve but not go down. So whatever students had in February or right before whatever shutdown um, is, is the lowest that that student's grade can exist at. And now this is not Culver City's arrangement. It's something that I hope to advocate for. And um, I know other districts have adopted, so it wouldn't be unprecedented to do that. So we'll see, and, and maybe we'll talk more about that on Tuesday. Great, Ray, uh, Ryan? Um, I had a question. It's kind of like where, like Culver City, like opening up again. Do you know if like this, like you will slowly open up the school or will like, this will be like in the fall, but like after this like whole pandemic is over, will you still like try to follow like the CCUSD in total, like, try to follow, like, regulations to how many students go, or will you, we, or will you follow, like, other districts as well? Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer. I can really only guess on that. Mm -hmm. uh, at the last board workshop where we had a live uh, Zoom session, school board member Steve Levin, you know, sort of speculated about the possibility that we would not be back in session in fall. Um, that's different than what some other school board members at other districts are saying where they do expect to be back in session in fall and they hope to be back in session for the late summer school session, maybe late July or August. Um, it's my impression based on public health um, mm -hmm. press and, and data and, and information is that is that it will require some antibody testing that we are moving into this <laughs> This kind of, uh, you know, it felt foreign until it didn't. And now it feels very real that we're moving into a phase where we'd have to have some sort of antibody testing and have some understanding of what immunity levels were to decide who could get back into the workplace. Um, so it sounds like, you know, students themselves are relatively shielded from the effects. And that also does mean that they're not as likely to transmit because when you don't have a big viral load, so if you're asymptomatic, you also have a relatively low viral, viral load, and that's especially true in, in younger people from what we can tell from this, from this particular virus. So it seems like with adults getting antibody tested and students going back into the classroom, there would be some possibility for folks who have immunity and students to be back in the classroom on a relatively normal um, level, but it's, it's really to be determined. Sarah? Um, this is just, you know, personal for me talking about uh, senior activities and stuff, but I'm curious as if to you have any inkling of an idea of what you think graduation would look like this spring. Yeah, that's the biggest question I would say. I, I would say that's like the biggest, um, it seems to be what Ed Services and, you know, the site administrators are, are really working the hardest on is because these, you know, milestone moments are really critical for, you know, all human beings, right? They're rites of passage for many of us. Um, and so I don't know, I, I do have faith that things are going to happen, but that they're probably going to happen virtually to some extent, um, but that there will be replacement events created. Um, you know, I, I have some optimism about it because there are, there are lots of positives and silver linings, as people say, in, in this crisis. I mean, just our last board workshop is an example. We had over 100 people attending and we maxed out at 100 because of our account at the time. And I'm pretty sure we would have had 200 if we had had an account that allowed for it, and we will for our next meeting. We usually have, I think all three of you know, empty boardrooms, like literally empty, like zero people. 
<laughs> and 200 people tried to come to our meeting. Like that's a huge positive as far as I can tell. And so I could imagine that some of these events, even though they're taking place in this way that we would never have asked for, they could be great. Like I do think great things can can come of them and we'll see and, and we'll need to challenge ourselves to be creative and, and open-minded. I don't have any specific answers for you. I'm sorry, Sarah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Lilibet? Um, so like, I know that you're doing the backpacks for kids and all in the high school, but are there any other, like on the other campuses for the schools? Are you gonna use that space for any like daycares for like students who have like working parents or anything else? Yes. Um, okay, so Backpacks is taking place out of the high school and Backpacks uses a list and so they individually reach out to their families and make sure that they can have the exchange. Um, and that list is expanding um, and in, in part due to the food bank distribution that has been happening with the Peace Project is we were able to collect a whole bunch of really important data and then share that data with the district so that they can expand their list and then reach out to those folks who weren't previously on our radar for needing support. Um, with respect to the space and the utilization of the space, um, we're really still first trying to figure out how to fiscally solve the childcare situation. So that's um, back to the whole layoff notices for the Office of Child Development staff. That, that is because that was a fee-based program. And so while state subsidized program for lower income families um, was supported by the governor, fee-based programs were not. And so that's why we had that kind of crisis moment where we thought we had to lay off a bunch of people. Since that time, uh, the state legislature has been looking at um, broadening their emergency relief. And it looks like now they're considering childcare workers, emergency essential, essential personnel. And so we, we, I'm hoping that that means that we will have a way to keep those folks employed and paid. Now, whether that means they can actually conduct childcare services or not is a completely different question and goes back to the whole public health question. And I don't know the answer because I it, it will depend on when the county gives authority for those things to take place. Like the city is, you know, the city of Culver City is also not holding any childcare. Um, so right now there's no childcare anywhere that I'm aware of through the district or the city. Uh, Ryan, did you have something else? Um, I just wanted to know, like, what have you found to be the most positive thing about, like, COVID-19? Like, what are you, like, I wouldn't want to say grateful for, but, like, I guess that is a good term to use, like, because, like you said, we are grateful for some things, like, to be positive. So, like, what are you most, like, grateful for of COVID-19, <laughs> even though COVID-19 is not really something to be grateful for? <laughs> Absolutely. But I do have an answer because I have been thinking about it a lot. I mean, I think actually one of the ways to stay emotionally well is to is to kind of insist that you spend some time finding the things to be grateful for. Um, and so I, I definitely have. And with respect to my role as a school board member, I mean, one of the places that I spend most of my intellectual resources is thinking about equity and how to serve kids where they need to be served and meet them where they need to be met. And we were finally, in my opinion, in my, um, I'm in my fifth year, and in my opinion, this was the year that I could really say I saw things starting to move. Like I really saw everybody getting on the same page and feeling kind of um, just very proud to stand tall in a, in a position where we were fighting for previously really, um, maybe marginalized student bodies. And so I was so devastated to think that all of that would come to a screeching halt. And then I actually came to see that there are two or three things that our, our hand is being forced in that are really positive with respect to equity specifically. One of them is that we are going to, the district, the Culver City Unified District is going to have to make individual contact with every single family. So without exception, we will now have to build a relationship between someone in the district office or at a site and someone who is responsible for a student. 
which that was not necessarily happening with every single student before, right? And there's just a ton of evidence showing that when you know a face and you know a name and you know a story, you're able to serve the family and serve the student. That's part of a, an umbrella term that's called multi-tiered systems of support that we've adopted in the district. So I feel really positive that our hand is gonna be forced and that we're gonna have to, because we have to figure out where they are. If they're not checking in with their teacher, we gotta figure out why. We have got to figure out how to get students engaged under these unique circumstances. That's the first thing. The second thing is that we have to get every student a Chromebook and a, and a hotspot or Wi-Fi. 100% of the students have to have access. And so far it's going relatively well, but that is already a huge leap. I mean, that in and of itself, I'm sure many of you know students who didn't have access to laptops, computers, whatever it is, Wi-Fi, internet access. So now we have to have 100% of our students absolutely having that access. So that's uh, the second one. Oh, I think your TV's on, Michelle. And then um, that made me forget my third one. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to my third piece, but those are really those are really big positives. Maybe it was the attendance at the board meeting. You know, maybe that folks will engage with the gover with the governing work, right? Rather than you know just trusting that we're doing okay. I would really love for folks to engage at a higher rate, and that does seem to be happening. And I, and I look forward to that. Sarah, did you have? A yeah, so this kind of this question kind of piggybacks off of your answer to the last question, but I'm curious as is to, if, if do you think that there there if you think that there are going to be any long term changes to the way the school board runs as uh, as, be, as uh, caused by this crisis. So the way the school board runs. Uh, the way the school board runs and interacts with students and the way that with the way that the district basically runs and the way that we teach. Okay, so the district, yes. I do think there will be some long-term impacts. I think that's true and, and I think there's no going back. Um, and what that looks like, so I guess what I want to see that I don't know that it will happen, but I think it could happen and this is the perfect scenario, the perfect environment for it, is that we really can do individualized education. So, it's the nature of being able to do a blended learning environment, which is both on, on devices and with people, right? And the adults are really critical. So by the way, it's very important in public education to be clear that teachers, physical human beings are super important, super critical, and that their need is not at all, uh, the need for them does not at all get um, minimized by virtual instruction or blended learning or online instruction or anything like that. So that's really important to be clear in, about so that the teachers are, are even more critical. In fact, it's much harder to teach and to learn in a virtual setting than it is to learn in, in a classroom. Um, but that difficulty in and of itself does, you know, um, what's the phrase about innovation that like the the instigator of innovation is desperation or something what's that cliche phrase i feel like i heard the opposite that's like the the um the seed of innovation is laziness but <laughs> you're probably thinking of something else desperation is the mother of invention it's that's that, yeah <laughs> that this difficulty will force us to be better educators right so i I, I feel like the p potential to have individualized instruction, like an ideal, something that Dr. Levin and I have talked about a bunch is that every kid should have an IEP. Every kid should have an individualized education plan, right? Why is it only kids who are designated as having special needs have individualized education plans, which they deserve, right? But we should, every student should have that because every student is an individual. So if, if I think that's a possibility for the long run, like, maybe out of this we can come to the place where we are actually individualizing instruction for every student um that's a hope i haven't figured it out beyond that <laughs> what an amazing conversation we've all had here um are there any final questions for dr kent before we Thank you so much for all you're doing. It's, it's really important that like all of this stuff is getting done and you're doing it and that's really great <laughs>
Thanks, yeah, Sarah. Thank it was you. Great to talk with all three of you. Ryan, thank you so much for your incredible performance and your work as an artist. Sarah, thank you. our brilliant Sarah, I'm super excited for your future. Lilibet, it was good to meet you. And I'm excited to continue to have a relationship with you over the next few years because you're going to be around for a while. Thank you all very much. This was super fun. Thank and you so much. Thank you so much. Um, and we'll see you soon. We'll see you in cyberspace. <laughs> all right. Thanks, you guys. Oh, thank you. Okay. Until the next one. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>